That is why this hacker could spark Africa because of well, the Nile. And the Nile is Egypt. These words have been spoken about the Egyptian civilization Egypt ever since Nile. time immemorial, and they still remain true today. The shape of Egypt's political borders that you see on maps well. isn't really the actual shape or reality of this country. In truth, Egypt's real shape looks much more like this. More than 102 million people call Egypt their home today, and an overwhelming 95% of all of them live either along the banks of the Nile River itself or within the Nile Delta region in the north, where the longest river in the world empties out into the Mediterranean Sea. Just before the Nile fans out into this extremely fertile delta region can be found the city of Cairo, okay. whose metropolitan population of more than 20 million people today ranks it as the largest urban area found anywhere on the African continent, and the sixth largest overall in the entire world. Because of these facts, there is perhaps no other country in the world whose population pattern can be more clearly seen from space and night, nor a river vision. whose path is more clearly visible. A glowing a white one. band of dense civilization snaking through an otherwise empty void of barren desert. The Sahara Desert in North Africa is one of the harshest and least hospitable environments to human civilization mm. anywhere on the planet. Acting like a vast ocean of sand with extremely scarce supplies of water, the Sahara successful. firmly separated contact and trade between the Mediterranean world and the African world beneath it for thousands of years, and even today, continues to act as a significant geographic barrier between the north and the south. But through a part of this vast and seemingly endless desert, the Nile River carves out the world's largest oasis through the sands of Egypt. For thousands of years, the Nile not only brought nearly inexhaustible supplies of water through the otherwise empty desert around it, but it also brought rich nutrients and minerals from deep within the African interior that would spill across the river's banks during floods and seep into the adjacent soils. The result was a long but narrow floodplain fueled with natural fertilizer and nearly infinite supplies of water that weren't dependent on unpredictable levels of rainfall that all ran through a very warm climate. In short, one of the most perfect locations on the entire planet to conduct large-scale agriculture that could support a huge and growing urban population. But the geographic setting of the Nile through the otherwise no, barren Sahara brought other unique benefits to Egyptian civilization mm, as well. Unlike other early river valley civilizations around the Tigris, Euphrates, or the Indus, the deserts around the yeah, Nile provided a thick that, layer of geographic defenses against any hostile invader. From the Nile Delta, it is nearly a thousand kilometers across the barren and rainless Sahara to the west before you reach another area that actually receives enough rainfall to support another urban population modern-day Benghazi, Libya. Sending an invasion force or a raiding party across a thousand kilometers of open and empty desert is a difficult thing to do now with tanks and trucks, let alone thousands of years ago. To the east of the Nile Delta is the Sinai Peninsula, which is almost as equally inhospitable and empty as the Sahara, and so similarly difficult for armies to cross, albeit shorter. To the north is the Mediterranean Sea, and then to the south, the Nile River Valley narrows and curves for more than a thousand kilometers through the desert. Invading armies coming from the south would have to choose between marching through the hostile, empty desert or follow the rich route of the Nile. But since the Nile itself is very narrow, that route can be easily defended by fortifications built by any civilization based around the Nile in Egypt. In short, the Nile River creates the largest and what richest oasis say? found anywhere in the world through Egypt, and this oasis is very difficult for any outside power to break into. Thus, a rich agricultural civilization could easily arise here and survive long enough in relative isolation from the outside world to thrive. And that's of course exactly what ended up happening. For nearly all of human history, right up until the 20th century, the Nile River Valley through Egypt was the most densely populated place in the world. It has only been surpassed in density in recent times by the Ganges Delta region between modern Bangladesh and West Bengal in India. And for thousands of years, the Nile in Egypt was one of the most significant agricultural production regions on the planet. During the Roman Empire, Egypt alone supplied the empire with around a third of its wheat and fueled the Roman conquests and expansion across the Mediterranean. 
Even today in the 21st century, the Nile still enables Egypt to be a top five global producer in a dozen different agricultural products, ranging from artichokes and onions to dates and garlic. But because rainfall everywhere across the Sahara Desert is scarce, including across Egypt, an overwhelming 97% of all of modern Egypt's water supplies for her 102 million citizens to drink and farm comes exclusively from the Nile. Without the life-giving water that the Nile provides, Egypt would simply die in the sun-baked Sahara. It is the core of everything that makes Egypt, Egypt. And so any perceived threat to the river would naturally be interpreted by any regime in Cairo as an existential threat to the survival of the state. For thousands of years, no such threat ever emerged to disrupt the life-giving waters that the Nile provides to Egypt until potentially a little more than a decade ago in 2011. For you see, as universally important as the Nile River is to Egypt, the river and all the water that flows through it does not begin in Egypt. Before the river even reaches Egypt, it stretches and winds for thousands of kilometers through ten other countries first. The Nile has no true single starting place, but is fed by two primary tributary rivers, the White Nile and the Blue Nile. The White Nile is fed by the waters of the African Great Lakes and roughly begins in Uganda. While the Blue Nile is fed by the vast waters originating in the high, rainy, and largely alpine climate type Ethiopian highlands, the largest continuous area of high elevation found anywhere on the African continent. During the monsoon season in the Indian Ocean lasting through the summer between June and September, the towering Ethiopian mountains will catch the precipitation from the moisture-rich Except winds because. blowing into the continent, which often causes Lake Tana in the northwest corner of Ethiopia to overflow and spill water into the Blue Nile. Nile that runs out of it, sending a flood surge downriver clear through across Egypt and into the Mediterranean, a phenomenon that often puzzled ancient and classical era civilizations in Egypt since the summer is also the driest part of the year in the Mediterranean with the least amount of rainfall. It is these summer floods through the Blue Nile that historically eroded enormous quantities of fertile soil from the temperate Ethiopian highlands, which then got carried downriver as silt, which then historically got deposited across the Egyptian floodplains like natural fertilizer when the surge moved further through the Nile and flooded. Eventually, the Blue and White Nile tributaries converge at the city of Khartoum in modern-day Sudan and then join together to form the full Khartoum. Nile River from there all the way through Egypt and the Delta into the Mediterranean. But the two tributaries contribute vastly different levels of water into the Nile further downriver through Egypt. During the summer monsoon season in the Indian Ocean, the overflowing Blue Nile contributes an overwhelming 85% of all the water that makes its way down to Egypt through the Nile. Overall, throughout the entire course of an average year, the Blue Nile contributes roughly 59% of all the water that makes its way through Egypt while the White Nile contributes the remaining 41%. Thus, the majority of the water in the Nile that flows through Egypt and supports all of Egyptian civilization has always begun in the Ethiopian highlands more than 1,200 kilometers away from Egypt's southernmost contemporary border. And now in the 21st century, Ethiopia would like to utilize this geographic advantage to help develop itself and increase its own prosperity. As the course of the Blue Nile slopes steeply down from the mountains of the Ethiopian highlands, the water running down the tributary contains a lot of violent rapids that possess a very high amount of kinetic energy. Maybe not an ideal situation for commercial navigation through the river, students. but a perfect scenario to capture the water's kinetic energy to spin a turbine to generate electricity. As such, there have been proposals and discussions going back decades Decades within Ethiopia to construct hydroelectric power dams across their sections of the Blue Nile. But these proposals have always been fiercely resisted by every single government that has ever found itself in power further to the north in Cairo. The fears in Egypt have always been that if Ethiopia were to construct any dams across their sections of the Blue Nile, they could interrupt or even decrease the flows of precious water through the Nile downriver to Egypt, and therefore threaten Egypt's survival as a state. In 1978, when Ethiopia was very publicly considering building a dam along the Blue Nile with Soviet backing, the Egyptian president at the time, Anwar Sadat, responded with a thinly veiled threat when he said, We are not going to wait to die of thirst in Egypt. We'll go to Ethiopia and die there instead. For many years prior to 2011, Egypt relied on its history of legal treaties with Western countries to essentially monopolize its control over all the waters in the Nile River, including the use of its waters beyond their own borders. In 1929, shortly after their independence from the United Kingdom, Egypt signed a treaty with Britain known as the 1929 Anglo-Egyptian Treaty, 
to 1920s Britain, Egypt remained a crucial country to keep happy and stable, because the UK still retained direct control over the all-important Suez Canal between the Mediterranean and Red Seas. Even after the rest of Egypt's okay. independence, for decades, the Suez Canal represented the quickest possible way for British vessels to reach India from the home island. And as such, wishing to placate Egypt and retain their colonial control over the canal, mm -hmm. Britain's 1929-era yeah, treaty with Egypt yeah. effectively granted Egypt and Sudan the rights to all of the water in the Nile River. It even gave Egypt the right to veto any construction project on the Nile or any of its tributaries further upriver in any of the ten other Nile countries that may interfere with the flow of water downstream into Egypt. Essentially, the UK recognized Egypt's complete dominion over the entirety of the Nile River in exchange for their own continued control over the Suez Canal. While the opinions of African countries like Ethiopia that were independent and free from colonialism at the time were simply ignored and not invited to participate in any of the negotiations. Consequently, Ethiopia doesn't respect this treaty as valid, and has insisted for decades that they do actually retain the right to build hydroelectric dams across the Blue Nile within their own sovereign territory to help them generate more power. Egypt loudly countered and insisted that they didn't actually have that right based on the 1929 treaty they signed with Britain, until an event in 2011 finally provided the Ethiopians with their chance. In that year, the Arab Spring ripped a wave of revolution and instability across the entire Arab world. As long-ruling Arab leaders faced down their restless and unsatisfied populations hungry for change. Hosni Mubarak, the man who had ruled Egypt as president for the past 30 years, was not immune to the wave of revolution and was toppled from power in the country as millions of protesters took to the streets and the military turned against him in a junta. Mere weeks after Mubarak was toppled after his decades-long rule and as Egypt remained in the midst of chaotic revolution, the Ethiopian government seized on the opportunity the chaos in Cairo provided by announcing that they would begin construction on an unprecedentedly massive hydroelectric dam project across the Blue Nile. It would become known as the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, or GERD for short, and Egypt was in no position to effectively resist it. The sheer scope of the GERD is truly something to behold. The Ethiopians planned it to become the largest hydroelectric power plant on the entire African continent when finished, and among the top 20 largest anywhere in the world. With a total of 13 turbines that will eventually generate more than 5,000 megawatts of electricity once fully operational, the dam would literally more than double the amount of electricity produced in Ethiopia when finished, and would therefore dramatically expand electricity access to the nearly half of the country's people who continue to remain in the darkness without any power. But that wouldn't even be the only tremendous benefit. So great would be the amount of electricity produced by the GERD that Ethiopia could even export the excess electricity produced there to neighboring countries in Africa as well, and earn further increased revenue. Tens of millions of Africans would gain access to electricity for the very first time, while the Ethiopian government would earn billions of dollars in increased revenue. When fully filled up to capacity, the massive reservoir created behind the GERD would be approximately half the size of Rhode Island in the United States, and could thus potentially provide enormous quantities of water that the Ethiopians could use to further expand their own irrigation and farming practices. And Ethiopia even further argued that the GERD would better regulate the flow of the Blue Nile so that downstream countries like Sudan and Egypt would benefit as well, with less floods impacting their agriculture and improved lifespans of their dams since the GERD would block damaging sediments from ever reaching them. And even further, Ethiopia is a highly ethnically and linguistically diverse country, with over 80 different ethnic groups and dozens of different languages all calling the country their home. The country has faced terrible internal struggles and civil wars all throughout its troubled modern history. But the construction of the GERD mega project became a unifying rallying call for the country's 120 million diverse people to finish. All Ethiopians of all backgrounds could get behind supporting the country's completion of the dam, as it became increasingly viewed as the best possible way for Ethiopia to lift tens of millions of their citizens out of poverty and bring itself into the 21st century industrialized world. But just as the GERD increasingly became viewed as an existential necessity for Ethiopia to finally escape from its poverty and sharp internal divisions, it also began being simultaneously viewed as an existential threat towards Egypt's very survival.
This was because once the dam had been finished being built in 2020, the Ethiopians would inevitably have to begin holding back the water supplies of the Blue Nile in order to fill a massive reservoir half the size of Rhode Island behind it. The question on everybody's minds in Egypt was how long would the Ethiopians take to fill it? If they took their time with it and spent a couple decades to fill the reservoir up, as Egypt initially began yeah, insisting they do, they would only hold back a relatively small amount of water in the Blue Nile every year, and thus continue allowing the vast majority of the Blue Nile's water year-round to continue flowing down Egypt. But on the other hand, if Ethiopia decided to fill up the reservoir very rapidly in a matter of only something like five years, then they would be holding back a massive amount of the Blue Nile's waters for all five of those years in order to do so. And Egypt would be left with greatly reduced water supplies for however long that process took. Egypt's situation during the reservoir's filling could also be made even worse during an unexpected period of drought, where rainfall levels and water volumes through the White Nile are lower than normal, and where Ethiopia continues holding water back in the Blue Nile to continue filling up the reservoir. Under a scenario like this, it is conceivable that Egypt could experience drastic cuts in their available water supply until the Gerd's reservoir is fully filled up. And if it happens that way, it will affect a lot more than just 102 million Egyptians drinking water and Egypt's scarce supplies of irrigation for farming. The Aswan High Dam in southern Egypt was constructed across the Nile back in the 1960s, which created behind it the huge reservoir known as Lake Nasser. This reservoir and dam has provided Egypt with similarly massive amounts of hydroelectricity as the GERD will for Ethiopia, a total of about 2100 megawatts that provides roughly 12% of all of Egypt's electricity needs. But if the GERD in Ethiopia holds back a lot of water on the Blue Nile to fill up its reservoir, Egypt fears that it will result in the water levels of Lake Nasser decreasing, as less water arrives to replace what is already lost to high levels of evaporation in the desert. And if Lake Nasser's water levels decrease, it means that the Aswan High Dam won't have as much water available to run through its turbines to generate electricity. And that means that Egypt will have to replace the loss in power by importing more expensive raw energy inputs like coal, gas, or oil. A difficult financial decision to make for a country that is seemingly always struggling with an economic crisis. Because of these reasons, a 2021 environmental research study found that Egypt would stand to lose approximately $28 billion in agricultural output if the Ethiopians insisted on filling up the Gerd's reservoir in five years and Egypt did nothing to mitigate its associated water deficits. According to the same study, if Ethiopia spent 10 years to fill up the reservoir, then Egypt would still stand to lose approximately $17 billion in agricultural output. And that is very bad for Egypt for a lot of reasons. Egypt is already struggling with its limited farmland around the Nile to adequately feed its booming population, and so has been forced into a situation where it has been the number one largest importer of wheat in the entire world for years. By 2022, imported wheat from abroad was providing roughly 62% of all of Egypt's wheat consumption, and a whopping 85% of all that imported wheat was coming from just two countries, Russia and Ukraine, who have been fighting the biggest land war in Europe of the 21st century against each other for all of the past year, which has severely disrupted both of their exports of wheat to places who need it a lot, like Egypt. And then there's also Egypt's terrible unemployment situation. One in five Egyptians who actually have a job are currently employed in the country's agricultural sector. And so massive agricultural losses incurred by Ethiopia filling up the Gerd's reservoir very quickly will result in a lot of them losing their jobs. This is potentially another catastrophic event for Egypt, because Egypt already has a very high unemployment rate of over 9% of their total labor force, a rate that is nearly triple the unemployment rate currently seen in Ethiopia, and a fact that is largely driven by Egypt's internal demographics. More than half of Egypt's entire population population of 102 million people have only been born since 1998, just 25 years ago. And only a bit over 4% of the population is of retirement age older than 65. Consequently, mm -hmm. Egypt's population has yeah, more than know. doubled in just the past 30 years. And so the country has one of the youngest populations of any okay. country in the world today. Mm -hmm. And the okay, simple problem is like that this. there are just not enough jobs in Egypt for so many young people all to have. 
Competition over the few available jobs is fierce. While the ever-growing population has placed higher demands and strains on Egypt's limited water and food supplies, and millions of unemployed young people in a country with almost nothing to really lose presents a very dangerous reality for whatever regime is currently in power. Desperate people without jobs or a future have enough time and willpower to carry out a revolution that can potentially reverse their fortunes. As happened the last time when unemployment peaked in Egypt around 12% back during the last revolution of 2011. These fragile internal demographic pressures within Egypt can be easily exacerbated by Ethiopia's filling up of the Gerd's Reservoir, as it stands to negatively impact Egypt's water and agricultural resources and push even more Egyptians into unemployment. Consequently, this is why Egypt began by demanding that Ethiopia take 12 to 21 years to fill up the Gerd's Reservoir, and has been currently demanding a timeline of 11 years. But delaying filling up the reservoir for a decade or more is a difficult pill for Ethiopia yes. to swallow, because it means more time that they won't be using the dam to produce electricity, resulting in billions of dollars worth of lost revenue and productivity for them, and the continued inability for them to use the electricity to further accelerate their development progress. As I said before, it is the clash of something that is simultaneously viewed as an existential necessity by one side, and an existential threat by the other. And that's what makes this situation so incredibly difficult to actually negotiate on. Beginning in 2020, Ethiopia appears to have settled on a seven-year time frame to fill up the Gerd's reservoir, much to the disagreement of Egypt. The two biggest points of divergence between them currently is on what happens if there is a drought during the filling process, and what happens during a disagreement between okay. them. Egypt has demanded that Ethiopia make clear commitments to ensuring the GERD will still release enough water downriver during periods of drought, in order for Egypt to continue functioning. But Ethiopia has refused any such commitments, and even refuses to agree on what actually constitutes a drought scenario. Further, Egypt has demanded that an agreement be made between themselves, Ethiopia, and Sudan around the GERD that includes a legally binding dispute resolution mechanism, which Ethiopia has also refused and insisted only on non-binding dispute resolution mechanisms instead. Egypt and Sudan have frequently sought out a third party to mediate talks between them and Ethiopia on the GERD, such as the United yeah. Nations, the United States, the European Union, and recently the African Union, all of which Ethiopia has rejected to consider. After the dam finished construction in 2020, Ethiopia unilaterally decided to begin its first filling of the reservoir during the rainy monsoon season in July, when water flow through the Blue Nile was the highest. In retaliation for what it perceived as a unilateral action without negotiating with Egypt, the United States decided to cut $100 million worth of foreign aid to Ethiopia in the aftermath. One year later, in July of 2021, Ethiopia went ahead with another unilateral second filling of the dam's reservoir during the monsoon season. And then a few months later, both Sudan and Egypt referred the situation to the United Nations Security Council for assistance for the first time. And then in July of 2022, Ethiopia unilaterally went ahead with its third and largest filling of the reservoir to date. Clearly, both Egypt and Sudan possess little available leverage to make Ethiopia ever consider changing its mind. By this point, they have likely exhausted all of their diplomatic efforts over the past 12 years of trying, and they possess no ability to financially dissuade Ethiopia either. And while the results of Ethiopia's three fillings of the reservoir during the rainy seasons of 2020 through 2022 have not yet proven as catastrophic to Egypt as they initially feared, it may only be a matter of time before they actually do. It is lucky that 2019 and 2020 were both unusually mm. wetter and rainier yes. years for Egypt um, than normal, okay. which helped to mitigate the effects of Ethiopia's initial filling. Ethiopia is not planning to have finished filling up the reservoir until around 2027, meaning that there are still probably at least five more fillings of the reservoir planned to happen before then. If a drought happens to strike Egypt and Sudan at any point over these next five years and the Ethiopians continue filling up the Gerd's reservoir according to their schedule, the Egyptian government could easily be placed into a very serious crisis situation. And with no ability to negotiate or financially influence their way out of it, Egypt will really only be left with two available options if this day ever comes in the next four years from when this video was made sit back and do nothing and see whatever happens to mm -hmm. Egypt's instability, or lash out against Ethiopia and the GERD with a military attack. Hypothetically uh -oh. speaking, 
The Egyptian High Command could theoretically authorize Victor. fighter jets, bombers, and or cruise missiles on a raiding mission to fly across the country and through Sudan's airspace, who would likely be friendly to such an operation, and then strike the GERD, which is only 40 kilometers beyond the Sudanese border. Such an action would be an incredibly high risk and dangerous decision to make. Mm -hmm. On paper, the Egyptian Air Force vastly outmatches its Ethiopian counterpart. The Ethiopians continue to largely rely on outdated Soviet-era fighters like the MiG-23 and Su-27, and they don't have very many of them in comparison to the Egyptian Air Force. Conversely, the Egyptian Air Force is a modern and capable force that should not be underestimated. They have more than 200 modern American-made F-16 fighters, and a couple dozen French-made Dassault Rafales, with dozens more ordered and still on the way. It is likely that the Egyptians do possess the ability to strike and blow up the GERD if they ever decide to do it. A successful strike would destroy the dam and free up the waters to flow back up to Egypt into Lake Nasser behind their Aswan High Dam, relieving the country of its hypothetical drought-like conditions during this desperate potential scenario. But obviously, this action would be interpreted as a major act of war in Ethiopia, yeah. and the Egyptians could expect massive retaliation coming from Addis Ababa and her allies. A $5 billion dam would be destroyed, along with more than a decade's worth of work on Ethiopia's part and their bright future of bringing electricity I'm access to half of their country gone. would be lying in ruins. Not to mention however many Ethiopians may be killed during such an attack. And internationally, an Egyptian bombing campaign carried out on Ethiopian soil would be almost inevitably interpreted as a major act of aggression, and Egypt would stand to be cast as a warmongering pariah state. Punitive international financial sanctions on Egypt could most likely be expected, while war with 120 million Ethiopians would be almost guaranteed. Sure enough, the president of Ethiopia, Abiy Ahmed, threatened as much back in 2019, when he said that he would be prepared to mobilize millions of men to fight Egypt over the GERD's future. So, while the strike may alleviate Egypt's drought in the immediate sense, Egypt's long-term prospects of continuing to function would probably end up looking a lot worse. War and sanctions are expensive to maintain for any country, and crippling for a country like Egypt that is already racked with internal demographic and resource issues. But a country who is pressed into a corner by something perceived as an existential threat is a country that is more willing to gamble and take massive risks in order to get out of that corner. And many people have already predicted that sooner or later, the time will come for Egypt to make this dangerous choice or not. It's a very dangerous situation because Egypt is not going to be able to live that way. And they'll end up blowing up the dam. And I said it, and I say it loud and clear. They'll blow up that dam, and they have to do something. Oh because they could have stopped it. They should have stopped it long before it was started. I said, how do you let it get built? And then you say they, they have a dam. In the end, I'm going to tell you again, and I'm going to tell you to the friends in Syria, that we can get to the point that you are going to miss the point of Maya from Egypt. And while all options may indeed be open in Cairo, including a military first strike, the risks are so far not worth the probable outcome. But with little ability to influence Ethiopia's unilateral willingness to continue filling up the dam's reservoir, Ethiopia has been setting a precedent for damming the Nile without any negotiations with any of its neighbors. In the future, Ethiopia may take further unilateral actions by building even more dams okay. along the Blue Nile without consulting any of her neighbors. The GERD is specifically a hydroelectric dam without any planned uses for irrigation, meaning that after the dam's reservoir is finished being filled, Ethiopia will supposedly not restrict any more water heading further downstream towards Egypt. But hypothetical future dams built with irrigation in mind will continue withdrawing water from the river to feed Ethiopian farms even after their reservoirs are filled, which will permanently reduce Egypt's supplies of water coming through the Blue Nile and all its climate change continues to negatively affect water resources across the African continent through the rest of the 21st century. The risk of flash floods, like what happened in Pakistan in 2022, could also happen in the future of the Nile Basin as well, where dams in one country further upstream could be damaged and then result in floods further downstream that could bury another country's agricultural regions beneath a thick in Egypt if a crisis like this ever emerges in the future. And as Ethiopia continues to unilaterally fill the GERD's reservoir and potentially goes on from there to build even more dams in the future, and as Egypt remains a fragile, water-insecure state that is vulnerable to 
to external shocks like these, the risk of massive military escalation exploding across the Nile Basin will continue to ratchet up and increase. Potential flashpoints that could trigger a greater conflict between them have already appeared. For decades, Ethiopia and Sudan have both clashed over the ownership of the Al Fashka Triangle, a fertile agricultural area nearby to the Gerd and its reservoir. Back in 2008, both sides had come to an agreement where Ethiopian farmers would till and work the land here, while Sudan would retain administrative authority over it. But that deal all came crashing down at the end of 2020, when the biggest war of the 21st century exploded within Ethiopia as the Tigray region rebelled against the central okay. Ethiopian government in Addis Ababa. Sudan decided to forcibly expel the Ethiopian farmers oh, from the Al Fashka Triangle and consolidate its control Ababa. as Ethiopia descended further into civil war and chaos and so lacked any viable method to retaliate. In June of 2022, the Ethiopian military allegedly opened fire in the region and shot dead mm -hmm. Sena civilian. And as the war in Tigray began to rage and fester into the bloodiest conflict of the entire 21st century within Ethiopia, the central government began accusing the Egyptians of covertly funneling weapons, ammunition, and supplies to the rebel forces in the Tigray region and other armed groups opposed to the Ethiopian government. The Tigray War, lasting between 2020 and 2022, ultimately became a sort of proxy war wherein the Egyptian government allegedly supplied the rebels to remove the Ethiopian government from power and hopefully install a new government in its place who would be more willing to enter into negotiations with Cairo over the GERD, its reservoir, and the future of the Nile. But by 2022, the war's ferocity had reached unprecedented levels not seen before in the 21st century. Rampant genocides and ethnic by every the... one of the sides involved. Totalitarian Eritrea's modern day invaded the Tigray region at the request of the Ethiopian government, while the Tigray rebel forces themselves came close to beating them all back and capturing the Ethiopian capital itself in Addis Ababa. Hundreds of thousands of troops on all sides were mobilized to fight against each other and by the conflict's conclusion after two years of near total 100,000 people okay. lay dead. Yeah, most of can watch the videos after this one. I think there's pretty much the overall. I'm going to make the video this for some. I'm going to make the video this for some.